Welcome, everybody. We're going to get started. I am Mark Levine, city council member from the 7th District in Northern Manhattan and chair of the City Council Health Committee. Welcome to another of our continuing conversations with leaders who are battling coronavirus. Last time you joined us for a conversation with Dr. Oxidis Barbeau, our wonderful health commissioner. And tonight, I am pleased that we are joined by none other than Diana Barrent, who is the founder of Survivor Corps, to talk about antibodies and the new tests that are emerging and donations of plasma and what this means for all of us. Um, I'm really excited to hear from all of you to get your questions. You know that we like to do these bilingually, so brevemente en español, bienvenidos. Mi nombre es Mark Lemín, concejal del Distrito 7 y presidente del Comité de Salud. Bienvenidos a otra en una serie de charlas con líderes pregando con lo que es la pandemia del coronavirus. Siéntense libres de hacer sus preguntas en inglés o español y le, contest le contestaremos en el idioma que usted prefiera. Welcome again, and I am so thrilled now to ask Diana Barrett to join us. Uh, I'll just say a word or two about her. Many of us have suffered with coronavirus, but very few have turned that in to a platform for activism, for leadership, and giving back the way Diana has. She has built something amazing, Survivor Corps, which is mobilizing those of us who have recovered from coronavirus to do something really big, to give back to people who are still fighting in hospitals by donating something pretty precious, our blood plasma. Because as she will explain, she will explain that has the ability to save lives. So we're going to talk all about that, what it means for you, and how you can get involved. Please, Diana, welcome. Could you tell us a little bit about your story and what Survivor Corps is? I would love to. Mark, thank you so much for having me on. This is a huge thrill for me. Um, so I got COVID a little bit early in the New York cycle. I was exposed on the evening of March 9th, and I woke up on Friday the 13th. Um, I wasn't a superstitious person beforehand, but I might have to revisit that. Um, there's nothing subtle about the symptoms I had. I had 102 fever. I had felt like I had an anvil on my chest. I had an immediate respiratory infection, a sore throat, um, which led to a host of other symptoms. And um, I am not a germaphobe at all by any stretch of the imagination. Um, up until a couple of months ago, I'd been a photographer for many years, and a year ago was chest high in the Ganges River, photographing the world's largest gathering of humanity, and I didn't even need a Pepto-Bismol. Um, so just to show that it can really strike anybody, I had been, you know, maybe a little bit too much of a braggart about my immunity of steel, but there is no immunity of steel when it comes to COVID-19. Um, and so I, despite not being a germaphobe, I am a news junkie. So I had been following the news coming out of China and then out of Italy very, very carefully. And I really saw that it was only a matter of time before it reached us. And so even a couple of weeks before I got sick, and I got sick very early on, um, I was taking every precaution. But when my kids were coming home from school every day, they're 11 and 13, I was making them put all of their clothes into the hot wash immediately and shower immediately. I canceled all routine medical appointments. I really thought I was taking every precaution. And lo and behold, I still was one of the first people in my area to get diagnosed with COVID. Um, I'm in Nassau County, right outside of Manhattan, although I am an Upper West Sider through and through from um, a native New Yorker. It's, um, but so when I got my positive diagnosis, which was on March 18th, I had sort of this aha moment in, you know, I have no background in science or, you know, public health, but I remember just enough to back to 10th grade biology to realize that my body was already um, fighting this virus off. The respiratory infection was already on its way out. I was felt like I was going to be in the clear. Um, and if I was going to be one of the first people diagnosed in my area with COVID, I would, if all things went well, and they have, as you can see, I'm fully recovered, um, I would be one of the first survivors. And with that came both a responsibility, but also this incredible opportunity. Because I remembered back to that 10th grade biology class and learning about antibodies. 
and realizing that my body had encountered this novel virus, um, it, novel in that is a virus that none of our bodies had ever seen before and didn't know how to react to. But my, do, my body did exactly what it was supposed to do and it built the antibodies to fight it off. Not everyone is that lucky. So I realized that I would have the opportunity to use those antibodies um, to help other people. And that if that was the power of one individual, if we could come together collectively, um, because everything that we do with regards to COVID, to the being in a moment of collective crisis has to be done in collaboration. We all have to work together. And so what we, what I did was I started this group called Survivor Corps. It was named after the Peace Corps um, and realized that if we could mobilize an army of volunteers, um, truly an army, and, and we have, we just hit 44,000 members in our open Facebook group. And that's not counting any of the traffic to our survivorcorps.com website, we have launched a literal call to arms, like literally call to arms, because inside the arm of every COVID-19 survivor are the antibodies that will lead us to a cure. And so there are sort of two ways that you can use those antibodies. You can go and you can donate your plasma that will be directly given to patients in need whose bodies were not able to mount their own antibody response. Um, and you can also donate your plasma to science. So for every new test that comes out, for every um, trial, vaccine trial, for every study to show perhaps when the best time to use convalescent plasma is, all of those answers, all of the mysteries to this virus lie in the bodies of survivors. So we can come together and be a literal part of the cure, which is just an incredibly powerful and motivating factor. Um, you know, it was reported the other day that Tom Hanks's blood will be part of the vaccine. But the truth is, so could mine, and so could yours, and so could anybody else's. Um, we have superpowers in our blood right now, and we need to harness them for good. And so what Survivor Corps is, is a one-stop shop where you can go and find all of the information on all of the opportunities that are available to you as a survivor, how you can become a superhero um, by donating that plasma, participating in every study that helps the medical, scientific, and academic communities get to get the answers that they need to end this pandemic. Well, wow, it's so inspiring to hear what you've done and, and, and to hear about the thousands of regular people who are stepping up. I want to talk a little bit about testing. Um, we've heard so much about um, tests to diagnose people, whether they have the virus. Right. Um, doctors might call that antigen testing. But what's really getting a lot of attention now is this new kind of test that you've talked about, which are antibody tests. Yes. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to break a little bit of news here because um, while I had uh, coronavirus, I believe, uh, uh, in March, uh, as did my wife, we weren't tested at the time because there was no testing really available for folks who weren't sick enough to be in hospital. Mm -hmm. But we went Monday and got an antigen, excuse me, an antibody test, and it came back positive. And so now so you I did have it. Yes, so now so we had no it. Question. Now you know you no have question. it. No question. And uh, but more importantly, now I am ready to donate plasma to help people who are still struggling in hospital, and I want to do it via Survivor Corps. So I let's make this that. happen. Mark, let's make a date and let's go together. We'll go to the I New can't York wait. Blood Center and I can't we'll wait. Together. I have to tell you, we'll talk about it more later, but donating plasma is, I mean, now we can go into the details after we've gone through the antibody questions, but um, it is no exaggeration to say that I will put, I've now done it four times. And each time you can look at the pictures, I have an ear to ear grin on my face. It is one of the most gratifying experiences and no offense to my family. And I hope they're not watching right now, but I would <laughs> put it among, I would put it up there with getting married and having children. Wow. There Amazing. are so few opportunities in a lifetime to actually <gasps> save life. And with every plasma donation, you have the potential to save three to four lives in a, a 29 to 32 minute pro painless process. 
Um, that's why it's been so easy to recruit people because there are very few people who have been touched by this. If you were unlucky enough to get COVID and lucky enough to get through it, um, you know, how could you not want to help? It is um, right now as a country, we are being told that the best thing that you can do is do nothing. And to a large extent that that's true. Absolutely. Stay home. <laughs> you know, don't, don't, don't leave if you don't have to. Um, that said, it goes against the human spirit to be told that there's nothing you can do to help. And here's this opportunity to literally save lives. Um, that, 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 that is amazing. I'm so excited for my opportunity to give. And I know many people on this Zoom or watching us on Facebook <laughs> are as well. Um, uh, could, could you explain a little bit about what these antibody tests are? I have a lot of questions, one from James Fritton, kind of explaining, asking us to explain the difference between various antibody tests, which we understand um, some are more accurate than others. Right. And can you, can you help uh, explain to us yeah. the difference and what these tests do and what they tell you? Right, so let me break it down a little bit. So the first test that you were referring to is the PCR test. That's a diagnostic test. That's something completely different. That's going to tell you whether you actually have the virus. For in people who are system. currently sick. Exactly. Right? exactly. Um, and you will find that people are testing positive on that PCR test for much longer than they still feel sick. Um, we are seeing through Survivor Corps that people are still testing positive on the PCR test at 14 days post-symptomatic. Is that um, because the virus is essentially in a dead form is still in your body? We don't know. We don't okay. know. Um, we don't know that it means that you're contagious, but we also don't mean know that it means that you're not contagious. Yeah. And so the one thing that you need to keep in mind, the most important thing when you're talking about these antibody tests, and we can then start talking about the differences between the various antibody tests is just because you get a positive diagnosis on a, your antibody test, it shows up that you have antibodies in your system, you could still very well be positive for the virus. You can have the antibodies and still be actively contagious. So the, the I will go through the, I'll go through some of the differences between the various antibody tests, but I caution everybody to treat them with extreme suspicion in terms of what information you can take from it. It is not a get out of jail free card by any that, It's imagine. such an important point. Uh, you need to protect yourself. You need to wear a face covering. You Absolutely. need to exercise social distancing. Um, really the same way anyone else would. You have to stay, take the same precautions that anyone would. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think that that is so important. And I, I did mine through Columbia University and sort of had, I had the gold standard of testing in right. addition to the subsequent negative PCR test. And I will tell you, I mean, I, um, I still wear a mask. Um, I maintain physical distancing. Um, I, was, I went in to donate plasma yesterday. I took the Long Island Railroad in. I was on multiple subways. When I got home, I disinfected myself as if I had just walked out of an ICU unit. Um, so, because it can still travel on your clothes and on your shoes, there's yeah. just so much that we don't know. And so from the get-go, I just wanna make it abundantly clear that having antibodies does not mean that you have immunity. I cannot right. say that over and over, I can't say it enough. Um, there is a strong suspicion of immunity. Um, that there's reason to believe that this COVID-19 is a type of coronavirus, which is a broader category, as SARS is a coronavirus. Um, and if we, there, it is, it is um, there's a very strong assumption that there will be immunity conferred by having these antibodies, but the science isn't there yet. And it's not gonna be there for a little while because the scientists can't ethically go and you know, take you or me, Mark, and now that we've recovered, give us a shot of COVID to see if we get reinfected. Right. It's right. going to have to wait until the second wave happens to see if yeah. that suspected immunity is, right. is actually there. Now, in terms of getting into the actual differences of the antibody tests, um, first of all, none of them are perfect right now. Yeah. yeah. Um, we're not there yet. So even with your positive diagnosis or your negative diagnosis, um, 
take it with a grain of salt. There is a high unreliability quotient to all of these tests. They have not gone through the same FDA proce approval procedures. Um, there are 10 that have been, either nine or 10, I believe, that have emergency FDA authorization. Um, that means that the FDA thinks that they are a cut above the rest. That doesn't mean that they're perfect by yeah. any means. Those are still not necessarily entirely reliable tests. And there are another hundred out there that have no FDA approval whatsoever. So yeah. if you are, so that would be the broadest category of tests to look at. If you are looking to get your antibodies tested and the reason why you would want to get your antibodies tested is so that you could go give plasma. Um, right now, you can't. The, there's not a lot of other information that you can do with that. But if that leads you to be able to donate plasma, then that's a terrific thing. Um, the landscape with the antibody testing is changing literally on a daily basis. But there are a few sort of things that I can explain. There are there, so there are two sorts of antibodies. There's the um, IgM and IgG. The Ig IgM is the first antibody that your body produces right when you get sick. And so that will continue for maybe 80, up to about 80 days, maybe less, we're not sure. Um, and then, you know, maybe about 10 days, two weeks into the cycle of the viral cycle, you start producing what's called um, IgG antibodies. And those are the ones that stay with you. And if and when that immunity is proven, that's what will be give you that long-term protection. So um, when you're looking at the various tests, you want to know that it's testing both the um, IgM and the IgG, or if it's only one, it's the IgG that's going to be the more helpful piece of information. Um, the IgM will show you that you had it more recently. But when it gets to the IgG test, they, they say 14 days from symptoms, but um, you really want to be closer to the 21, even 28 day mark from symptoms because your antibody level will continue to increase. The, that, um, that IgG level will continue to increase through, through that, you know, and continue past that 28 days. But that's where you're going to get your most accurate sort of timeline, your window. And also, it will allow you to donate plasma if you've been 28 days symptom free through places like the New York Blood Bank, Blood Center and others without needing a follow up negative diagnostic test. And we know I have a, gonna come a, a, a very quick question, but an important one from Yona Mensalopoulou, who she is asking um, exactly how do you um, conduct the test? Is it, is it a blood sample? Is it a finger prick? Well, um, it, it can be various. So that's a good question. So um, I'm not a scientist, obviously, but I've done a lot of reading on this and a lot of learning up. And um, one of the benefits of not being a scientist is sort of being able to look at it from a bit of a bird's eye perspective and see what makes sense and what doesn't make sense. And um, one thing that I can say is if it is an at-home kit, if it's a fingertip prick, um, that you're going to get the results in five to 10 minutes. Um, I would probably skip that right now. I don't think that those are going to be accurate enough at this point in time. And we can have another conversation in two weeks and I'm sure the landscape will be very, very different. But um, I actually just got back a few minutes ago from taking my own children to go get their antibodies tested because because both my husband and I had positive diagnoses and they had COVID-like symptoms. Is and there a minimum age, Diana, for getting the for test? The antibody, for the antibody testing, no. You, um, you have to be old that they wouldn't be in a position to donate plasma, but um, because they're right. 11 and 13, they're too young. But um, I, you know, I was really curious. Do you actually have to be 18 to donate plasma? Is that the rule? I, I, I think it's, it's 17. It's whatever the Red Cross rules are. Got it, the right. Same blood, it's the yeah. same rules mm -hmm. apply. Yeah. Um, so, you know, the, the, not that they would be able to donate plasma, but I just took them for a test. They received the Abbott test, which was a blood draw. And that is done in a lab. 
um, and is a more reliable, again, within these parameters of none of them being perfect tests. But I would definitely um, veer towards the tests that are conducted in labs, um, not the ones that are either saliva-based saliva based swab based or fingertip prick based that you're getting immediate results right um and for you know a, a, i mean not to not to plug survivor core too much but i can't help it um if you go to our website survivorcore.com we have a complete section on antibody testing and we break down in a frequently asked questions the differences between all of these tests and what do all of these terms mean because navigating this landscape can make sorting your through your health insurance policy look like a breeze by comparison so yes. we've done that work for you yes um I, I want folks to know that actually the city is going to start offering free antibody tests uh to the public um actually they're gonna provide 140,000 to frontline healthcare workers but now they're offering some to the general public it's going to be one site in every borough. And it turns out that the Manhattan site is in my district. Uh, it's going to be at uh, the address is 21 Old Broadway. It's just north of 125th Street and just east of Broadway. Um, tomorrow, we hope to have a phone number available that you can call to register. You have to do it by appointment. And the service itself, we think, will be up and running next week. We don't know yet which specific antibody tests they'll be using, which will be a follow up question. Um, yeah, but we, we want curious to find out that's great though. Yes. Uh, you know, as long as everyone who gets the test understands, uh, what Diana and I have been saying, right. is, it comes if you get a, a positive caveat. back, yes. And yes. actually this is a point at the lower repetir in Espanol, porque hay que hacerle hincapié, muy importante. Si usted se le da un resultado positivo de su prueba de anticuerpos, no crean, no crean que, que tengan inmunidad, porque todavía no entendemos muy bien Cómo eso funciona. Así que está bien que se que se hacen que se hagan ese examen, pero cuidado. No crean que quiere decir que tienen inmunidad. So a little point on Spanish there. Um, we've had a number of questions about uh, the uh, programs which are offering plasma donation. We know that Mount Sinai has one. I think they were first out of the gate. Um, yeah, they were. The, Mount Sinai had the first convalescent plasma program going on in the city. In the country, right? Um, I don't know. Uh, perhaps the country. I'm not sure. I'm going to give them credit for it. I do what know that it? was the first one in New York. Um, and actually, that was one of the reasons that spurred me to create Survivor Corps is because right when I got sick, um, I started receiving the same email that was going around sort of like chain mail from Mount Sinai, hoping that it would land in the lap of a COVID survivor who had been symptom free for 14 days, of which there were very few at the time. And so I got the, I went, I was one of the first people in my area to actually go public with saying that I did have COVID-19. There was a huge stigma against it, which to me, I could not understand why, given the fact that it is the most, um, contagious airborne virus we've ever encountered um so it seemed odd for there for it to be stigmatized but i went out and was very public about it and so everybody started forwarding me this email from mount sinai and i realized that there were going to be if mount sinai was the first they were not going to be the last and so soon you had montefiore and the rockefeller institute and columbia and and why you have various other um Nonprofit hospitals now you have um, you know Northwell and um, my husband just donated through Stony Brook yesterday. You have all of these other programs, and what I saw what was going to happen was that there was going to be a free market um, where survivors were a commodity, and right. that was not efficient. Um, and as I said before, throughout this entire, th when you're dealing with the global pandemic, when you're dealing with the moment of collective crisis, you need efficiency and you need collaboration. Right. And so instead of having each of these hospitals mount their own recruiting process and their own PR campaign, we've done it for them. Right. So we have gathered this, you know, we're mobilizing this army of volunteers. And by doing that, we have been able to flood all of these systems. Um, I was participant number 0001 at Columbia University's Convalescent Plasma Program. I'm very proud of that. Um, but I'm also, I'm even more proud of the fact that they now have a 6,000 person waiting list 
to get into their program. Um, and so that is a sign of how many people there are out there who want to participate. And um, also the fact that in the meantime, those people can be contributing to scientific studies with that same plasma and doing just as much good. So when I went to, once I passed through the Columbia screening process, I was referred to the New York Blood Center and my first batch of plasma went back to Columbia for study and every subsequent donation has gone into the general pool, which is distributed to patients on an as needed basis. I don't mean to brag again here, but I happen to be a universal donor. Um, <laughs> so I, I've never been so excited about my blood type before, but um, as AB positive blood, the blood matches and plasma matches are actually different from one another. So my doctor has referred to my plasma as liquid gold. Oh my gosh. So I have a question from Rhonda Freed, uh, who said that she was told by uh, her local Red Cross that uh, she did not need to be retested to see if she still had the virus. She's been asymptomatic for over a month. Um, and does that mean it's safe to donate? And uh, th that would be a good opportunity also to explain that different, um, different plasma donation programs have different requirements on testing. For example, if I'm not mistaken, New York Blood Bank uh, requires that you have that you had a positive test while you were sick. Um, no. Where, no, I'm wrong about not that. Anymore. Okay, not please, anymore. Care, please clarify and please answer Rhonda's question as well. <laughs> so, I mean, again, these are these are things that are changing on a daily basis. So, initially for Mount Sinai, you did need the positive diagnosis at first, and then a negative follow-up diagnosis. Um, the same with Columbia. All of these things are changing on a daily basis. Okay. So right now, the New York Blood Center, if you show that you have an antibody test, and even if you never had an initial positive right. diagnosis, right. for so right. many of us, I had to fight tooth and nail to get my test. Um, and you know, I was in the vast minority of people who were actually able to secure a test at that time in mid-March. And, um, but if you suspect that you had COVID and you then go get an antibody right. test, it comes out positive and you are 28 days symptom free, then you are eligible to donate plasma through the New York Blood Center. Um, they will then screen your blood afterwards in the same way that they would screen your blood for all pathogens. Um, yeah. to make sure that you don't have hepatitis in your blood, that there's no HIV, that there aren't any other pathogens that could do more harm than good. Um, so they are testing it on their end, but they but don't expect to receive your results from them. It's not a workaround to get your antibodies tested um, that you have to do beforehand. So they're quite explicit in that you will not be receiving that information, but it is screened to make sure that the ultimate product is safe. Well, but, that, but that, that, that's in your flood center. The Red Cross has different rules, um, you know, and each program, again, is changing their requirements on a daily basis. That's excellent. So we, we had an, uh, an unusual question from Lori Boris, which is that she had heard that for some blood donations, there's actually a height limit that you have to be a certain height. Uh, is that true of, of plasma donation or any um, donation of blood? Sorry, I'm, I'm moving my leg. No problem. No problem. <laughs> um, there is, yes. So basically the same rules apply as if you were giving blood. So um, I don't know what the height uh, requirement is. I know that you have to be at least 110 pounds. Um, and the same rules apply in terms of sexual orientation and activity. Um, if you've had your ears pierced or tattoos done in you know, the recent past, your travel history, um, multiple pregnancies can result in, in the HLA um, being too high in women's bodies. So um, a lot of women are not allowed to donate for those reasons. Um, that said, even if you are disqualified based on those results, doesn't mean that you can't donate to science because they're looking for just a couple of test tubes. They're not looking for the same quantity. So your height and weight might not be a res restriction for them. Um, HIV status might be, um, but, but HLA what about LGBT status? 
Um, so the rules have been relaxed. Um, unfortunately, they have not yet, been, the new rules have not yet been implemented, um, which is frustrating to say the least. Well, it's, it's outrageous. I mean, that people who want to give in the society are told they can't. Yeah. Uh, uh, it's, 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 a, it's a remnant of, of bigotry, which we should have long done away with. Absolutely. And I, my, my, I, I, I couldn't agree with you more on that. Um, I think that it is, you know, what I, I, we are partners with the American Association of Blood Banks and we, I did a Facebook Live with them a couple of weeks ago and really pushed them on this subject because, I, you know, I was like, okay, well, that's great that you reduced the number of months for, you know, gay men to be able to donate, but I just went to the New York Blood Center the other day and none of those rules are yeah. are even reflected. And I went, I've been back since the last two weeks and they still haven't been. And they say that it'll take months, which I don't understand. It's one line of code in a computer program that I imagine my 11 year old could probably fix in about an hour. Um, right. I then further pressed and said, well, you know, what is the incubation period of HIV and was told that it was in the seven to 10 day area. And so, I, so my immediate question was, well, then why aren't the rules 14 days? Like, why are we even talking about them a matter of months? Um, and I have not yet gotten a satisfactory answer on that, but I am in absolute full agreement that these are archaic rules in the same way that the rules saying that if you spent up to, you know, three months in the United Kingdom prior to 1996, you're disqualified on the basis that you could have been exposed to mad cow disease. That's I insanity. Think if, if you insanity. are on your deathbed and you're on a ventilator and your choice is a 40 year incubation period for mad cow disease <laughs> or a possibility at life. Um, I, I don't think you'd really have to ask anyone twice which choice they would make. So, you know, hopefully this situation will lead to further um, relaxations within those rules. I mean, and right. it's hard to protect people. Um, you know, in terms of how many times you're allowed to donate in, in a particular period of time, a lot of those rules are really done to protect the individual. So I actually right. went for my fifth donation yesterday and I got turned down, have to go back next week because my iron levels were, you know, like literally a hair off of where they should be simply because I don't, I had already donated four times in the previous four weeks. My goodness. So it meant that I had to take a week off and I'll donate again next week. But some of the rules are there for your own protection and others are vestiges of, um, of times past and it is far past, it is, it is past time to correct that. Indeed. So we, we had several questions about folks who are asymptomatic or um, wonder whether they may have had coronavirus, uh, but were asymptomatic. Um, one of the questions comes from Trevor Holland. Um, uh, someone else asked, can you still get testing at the old Broadway site or any of the city sites that are starting soon if you um, never had symptoms? And the answer is yes. And in fact, this is very important. It's an important way that public health officials can understand just how widely has the virus spread? Because we do know some people will have it and never have symptoms. And so what Governor Cuomo did or has been doing in the last week or two in uh, random testings, antibody testings around the state um, has been for people, whether they've been sick or whether they don't think they were sick or maybe suspected they were sick because we want the full picture. And what we learned um, is that a heck of a lot more people probably than we expected have had the virus in New York City, um, it was over 20%. Um, and that might mean that there are 1.8 million people in New York City who have had this virus, some of whom didn't know it. But it's important for us to understand just how far the virus has spread. So again, Trevor, even if you haven't had symptoms, um, certainly uh, it would be appropriate for you uh, to seek an antibody test. Did yeah, you have something I mean, to add? Please. Yeah, I mean, I, I would say I would say that I think that for all of the information that we cannot figure out on a, you know, so it's it's frustrating because there's a limitation. You have the antibody test, but then you're like, okay, great, what do I do with this information now? 
Um, but you are serving a public health good because the best policies will come out of having the best, um, the best information. And a lot of that is based on demographics and where we get to the, um, those magic numbers of the flattening of the curve of where we get close to herd immunity, where we get close, to, even just on a demographic, if, you know, in terms of eventual reopening, a lot of it will be based on those, um, those numbers. So you're contributing to um, science-based policy answers by participating in these tests. So we, we have a question from uh, uh, Mariana Ramirez, who asks, ¿Cuándo es que vamos a tener vacuna? Eso es lo mismo que inmunidad. So this is a question about when we're going to have a vaccine and if that's the same thing as immunity. And uh, the short answer is um, we don't know exactly when we're going to have yeah, a vaccine. I was vaccine. about to say, I can't wait to hear your answer on that one. <laughs> <laughs> and we shouldn't assume it's coming soon. We should prepare for a long haul. I think a fair assumption would be between one and two years, but um, even that is not guaranteed. And you know, if we have a lot of lucky breakthroughs, it could be sooner, um, but we really shouldn't count on that. Uh, I'm going to repeat that in part in Spanish from Mariana. Um, realmente no sabemos cuándo es que vamos a tener vacuna. Podríamos decir que entre un año y dos años, pero cuidado porque no se sabe Posiblemente más antes si, si todo nos va bien, pero hay que preparar que para prepararnos para eh, una lar un largo proceso de, de llegar a ese momento. And uh, in fact, uh, people talk about will there be an enough immunity in the society from people who have had the disease? Um, and could we get to herd immunity, which means 60 or 70 percent? Well, really, there's two ways to get there. One is that enough of us can have the disease and develop antibodies and hopefully get immunity. The other is we can deploy a vaccine. So um, but keep in mind that please, the, yeah. the vaccine is not, um, first of all, I don't think it's coming so soon. And secondly, unless it is available globally and has access, there's complete access Yes. Um, and one thing that we need, I mean, we cannot talk about COVID without talking about the mass discrepancy in people's um, access to healthcare and yes. access to vaccines, willingness to take vaccines. It has to be um, a one, as far as I'm concerned, it can't be one of these uh, vaccines that needs a booster shot because you're never going to be able to track down all of those people a worldwide population twice. Right. Um, you know, listening to Laurie Garrett, who who wrote The Coming Plague and has been sort of named the Cassandra of yeah, yeah. you know the science world, listening to her recommendations, they make all the sense in the world. And so um that vaccine is not going to be a magic bullet necessarily because we need it on a global, fully accessible basis. And we need to look at what stopgap efforts that are going to help us between now and then. And yeah. what I see as sort of the most promising of, of those is a hyperimmune globulin product, which is basically you translate take, that to English, please. I'm about to. I'm about okay. to. Um, so I, I literally had to look down at the piece of paper to remind myself how to pronounce it. So. Okay. Is basically taking gallons of convalescent plasma, plasma from people who have the antibodies in their system. And you take gallons of it and you spin it around and you basically make, you know, if you were cooking and you're making a sauce reduction, you are making an antibody reduction. So right now, if I donate plasma and it's given to an individual, it's literally my plasma through an IV right into their body. But what this would be is a concentrated um, vial that could be given as a shot to either or to somebody early in the viral cycle or even perhaps prophylactically to frontline workers who are being exposed to a very high viral load. So there have been a lot of studies showing the more um, exposure you have to the virus, the sicker you're going to get. And so by creating this concentrated product, 
um, and figuring out what the best times are to use that product right. and which antibodies work best when during that viral cycle. All of those scientific studies and um, you know, right now, both Columbia and Johns Hopkins are studying exactly that. And it's so cool to know that my plasma is part of that study. Um, and I was just did wow. a, was talking to another Survivor Corps member yesterday whose plasma will be part of the Johns Hopkins study. Oh and, my goodness. Yeah, so I mean, it's you are really helping get to these practical full solutions that will help us until we get that vaccine, until it becomes as widely available as it will need to be. So we, we have a question from William, M. William Engel who asks, is the infrastructure we have in place sufficient to conduct antibody testing on a mass scale? How many antibody tests per day do you think the city will be able to conduct going forward? I'm going to leave that one to you, Mark. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, I can tell you that the city has announced, as I mentioned earlier, 140 antibody tests are going to be made available for frontline medical workers. And they've announced a program uh, one, one of the sites is in my district I mentioned for the general public. And um, they've committed to making 70,000 tests available as part of that program for now. The good news on antibody tests is we don't face the same kind of shortages on reagents and other supplies that we do for the kind of test, the diagnostic tests that tell you whether or not you have coronavirus. So I'm a lot more worried about the lack of testing to determine whether people have the virus, because we need that probably on a scale of 10 times what we have today to, in my opinion, um, keep us safe and contain the virus. Um, it seems like the concern with antibody testing is, uh, in a sense, almost that there's too much uh, in that there are some tests on the market that have very high false positives because the FDA has not been regulating it tightly. And for the reasons that Diana and I have spoken about, you know, a false positive could give someone the impression, oh good, I'm immune, I don't have to protect myself. Now we know anyone on this Zoom- Even with a true positive. Not that's true, uh, exactly. <laughs> anyone on this Zoom, you know the deal. But you know, exactly. in the general you population- kind of, one thing you walk away from this hour with, it is that piece of information and please share it with everyone you know. I cannot underscore how important that piece is. There's yes. one thing to remember. Yes, so uh, uh, Trevor Holland asked a, a big picture question, um, which is, is there a way out of this pandemic besides immunity, immunity testing and vaccinations? For those who do not have antibodies, will they have to wait for a vaccination? So, so you know, Trevor, um, and to all of you wondering this, um, the news is not great here. And the truth is that um, until we have broad immunity in our population, either because we have produced and deployed a vaccine, a vaccine in huge numbers, as Diana mentioned, I mean, we're talking billions of doses because you have to have the whole world protected. Or it takes so long and so much of us get the virus that we have herd immunity. We're gonna have to live with real limitations and we're gonna have to take real precautions. But here's some optimism for you. If we can ramp up testing, diagnostic testing, just the, the standard testing to tell whether people have it. And if we can put in place a program to trace the contacts, contacts of anyone who's sick and therefore alert people who might've been exposed so that they can quarantine, then we can contain this virus. So that unlike today, when you go out in public, if we do all that I just mentioned, you can have pretty good confidence that the person standing next to you or sitting next to you doesn't have the virus. Today, when we go out on pub in public, I mean, who knows, right? Because if the virus is so widespread, we're getting probably two or 3,000 new cases every day still. That's down from what it was, but that's why we're all sheltering at home if we can. And those of us who need to go out in public for work have to take a lot of precautions. But 
if we can test what brought broadly, when I say test broadly, I mean, perhaps test every medical worker every day for before their shift, um, test transit workers a couple times a week and have testing available really for anybody who wants it, even if they're asymptomatic and then trace the contacts so that if one person is sick, we can stop it right now. One person gets sick, their family, their coworkers, everyone around them gets sick. And then we, um, and then we, we have it spread uncontrollably. So we're building this system now in New York. We're building a contact tracing system. Um, it is going to be huge. And for any of you who are on Twitter, I just did a post right before this Q and A um, with about a dozen or so questions about how that'll work. Um, but this offers hope and it's actually worked in other countries. South Germany, Korea has yeah. done this. Germany oh. is doing a terrific job with exactly. it. Exactly. But it should be, it, I, can, I just interrupt for a second. I, it needs to be every person's personal, civic, moral responsibility that if you have been infected or you think you might have been infected, that you be the end of your line of infection, that you do not allow it to be passed on. So when I initially thought that I was had COVID and people thought I was crazy because there were so few people who had been diagnosed at that point. How could I possibly have COVID? I was nervous enough that I went on to my town's Facebook page and I put out a, a list literally documenting every single place I had been in the previous 10 days. And I contacted every single person who I had had contact with. So they knew to quarantine themselves and in turn, Tell, the, tell other people. And I have now traced my own infection back to a meeting um, that I was at where four of the people at the meeting on March 9th had just been at a conference at the Sheridan Hotel from the 2nd to the 7th of March, which turned out to be a vortex of infection. Yeah. And when those people were warned, they did not tell the people who they had subsequently exposed. So we need to also have a level of personal responsibility that's part yes. of that. So Mar Marva Wade just asked a question, are tests free and um, does your immigration status matter? Thank you. If you're talking about the antibody test, which the city is rolling out, including at the site I mentioned, in my district, actually they are free. And it doesn't matter what your health insurance status is or what your immigration status is. Uh, that's really important. Um, and for the kind of broad testing to, see, to diagnose if you have it, um, all the city sponsored programs, that is the policy. Um, again, uh, it doesn't matter your ability to pay, your health insurance status or your immigration status. Now, Sharon Morris just asked a question on contact tracing, which I hear a lot. What about privacy? The city, the contact tracers are going to be collecting a lot of information about you. Um, and uh, there's, there are going to be real solid protections for privacy. In fact, if a contact tracer calls you and says, um, somebody who you were in close sustained contact with has the virus, and we need you to quarantine, they actually won't tell you the name of the person who they believe might have passed the virus to you. All you need to know is that you have been exposed and then it's on you to quarantine. They won't give up the name of the person. So for concerns about the stigma uh, or being blamed or privacy there, uh, they won't tell you. And um, the city is also, incredibly committed to making sure that um, people who are undocumented are not in any way at risk of federal authorities having access to the database. And, you know, we confronted this um, with uh, our ID NYC, the, the municipal ID, um, where there was rumblings of the feds trying to get access to that database and we held them off. Um, I really do believe we'll do it again. Um, one more point I want to make about um, about this question of making sure the transmission stops with you. Um, if you live in a small New York City apartment with other family members, when one member of the household is sick, it is really hard to protect everyone else. There are steps you can do to isolate in, in one bedroom if you have that luxury. If you have a luxury of a second bathroom, you reserve one for the sick person. Everyone needs to clean a lot. 
I did all of those things. And I'm sorry to say that my wife still contracted the virus. I did um, it in a suburban house and my husband still got it. <laughs> well, it's really tough. Good news, though. The city is launching a program that will provide a hotel room to people who need to isolate if one member of the household is sick and they want to protect the rest. Um, this has just started in the last two weeks, and the city will offer this hotel room free of charge. Also, again, it doesn't matter what your immigration status is. And you might say, well, I'm stuck in my hotel room. How do I eat? The city will bring you food. Well, how do I get my prescriptions? The city will bring you your prescriptions. What if I have to do laundry? The city will do the laundry for you. And there's going to also be a limited medical staff in the building, uh, an EMT tech and probably a nurse, um, and they will check on you daily. So this is an incredible program. And yes, as of yesterday now, there's a 1-800 number that you can call if you or someone of your household wants to access this. So it's 1-888-NYC-4NYC. Again, if you or a member of your household uh, need to isolate to protect your family and you want to access one of these hotel rooms, call 888-NYC-4, the number 4, NYC, and, and, and you will be connected to a clinician who will talk about your case. This is going to be one of the pillars of making it safe for us to reopen, um, having this kind of protection so that people can isolate. Really, the four pillars, in my opinion, of safely reopening are mass testing, contact tracing, isolating for people, like I just mentioned, who are in crowded homes, and the last one is quarantining, which we've talked about. And that comes in for the people who aren't yet sick, but are told they might be, and they need to stay home um, uh, to monitor themselves for symptoms. Uh, we can do this, New York. We can do it, and it's going to keep us safe. And we all have a role to play in making that successful. Um, did you want to say something, Diana? Yeah, I mean, I think that's incredible. I mean, especially after seeing some of these reports that have been in the news over the last couple of days about how 60% of people who are getting infected are have been staying at home and you have the you know people especially in the city who are living in very cramped quarters and right. that could be a huge spread of contagion so i think that that is um truly one of the most innovative interesting approaches and really effective so i'm thrilled to hear that that's taking place yes so we have a question from an anonymous uh, participant who says recognizing that the antibody test sorry let me get this right. Sorry, it is. I read recently that pharmaceutical companies are selling donated plasma. What are your thoughts? Um, I is that true? Of, it is. It is. Plasma has historically been a multi-billion dollar business. There have been people who have put themselves through college for years selling plasma. Um, if plasma was valuable before, um, convalescent plasma or plasma from people who have those antibodies, um, particularly like me who are um, universal donors who are only 4% of the population. Yeah. If there is a real value to that plasma. And what we at Survivor Corps are trying to do is now that we have filled sort of this um, you know, we've 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 filled the capacity of these nonprofit institutions, you know, beyond their capacity. We want to turn that fire hose onto the scientific community so that we take the profiteering out of the system. Right. Um, one, there's no room for profiteering in the, it right here in this market. You know, free markets work well in a lot of places, not during a global pandemic. Right. Um, and I also see that there's a true moral hazard to, you know, it, when you start paying people 
for their convalescent plasma and if people have been out of work for a long time and there's no prospect of employment down the line, we could see people, uh, the horrible vision of people purposefully infecting themselves with yeah. COVID in order to sell their plasma. And remember, they're selling it for a hundred bucks. It's being resold for thousands of dollars, wow. thousands wow. and thousands of dollars. And so we are working very hard to try to break up that um, that historic model so that we don't get into those problems. So we're, we're, we're running out of time. We have about five minutes. I want to see if we can get one or two more questions. And I have uh, a very good one from Bonnie Moses. She says, I've read about discussions for issuing an immunity passport to those with the detection of antibodies um, as a way to enable individuals to travel or return to work. Um, and she, she goes on uh, with, with more questions about that. But um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to first tell you my concerns with that. Um, one is the uh, inaccuracy of some antibody tests. Two is our uncertainty about the degree to which you really do have immunity from antibodies. Next, um, that I worry it would create um, unintended incentives that you know, people might try to get sick so they can get the antibodies and get the passport. Right. And right. That, per that person got the, got, got the disease and gets to go back to work. Meanwhile, right. I followed all the rules. I stayed exactly. home. Exactly. I, I quarantined exactly the way I was supposed to, and now I can't go back to work right. and I can't get a paycheck. And it, do it, it does, to, to some extent, almost create like a, a, a class system of you know, people, people who have you know, the, the quote, lucky ones and the unlucky ones. So there's a, a lot of reasons why I don't think that makes sense. And my read on New York City is we're not heading in that direction uh, because of the reasons that I outlined. Um, but did you want to add anything to that? Uh, no, I think I think I think you expressed it perfectly. But I, I think that the sort of baseline is the science isn't there. So we can't call anything immunity until we know that there's immunity and that those need to be longitudinal studies because we don't know, let's say there is immunity. Is it the type of immunity that the chicken pox gives you? That's a lifetime immunity. Does it right. last for a year like a cold or three years like other types of coronaviruses? We don't know. And so until we um, engage in those longitudinal patient driven studies, we're not gonna be able to get those answers. Yes. Um, I, I have a question uh, from, from Jonathan, uh, who, uh, who says that, um, uh, I guess I'm not going to mention, he, he gave some specific medical in information, but I'll just say that he's got some medical challenges and mm -hmm. wants to know whether getting an antibody test would, um, would lead him to, to make different uh, decisions about his care. And I'll, I'll, I'll give you an almost direct quote from the health department, mm -hmm. which is because of all the caveats we've discussed uh, in this chat, um, the health department has said, and I quote, antibody tests should not be used to make personal healthcare decisions. Right. Again, it's incredibly valuable if you want to donate plasma. It's incredibly valuable for epidemiologists to understand for policy just how far Absolutely. yes this virus has spread and i also understand you know from a human perspective people just want to know whether i had it but you don't use this as an excuse to not wear a face covering or to stop those social distancing and You're actually this is a cocktail party with the other people correct. who also passed their antibody tests like and to that's to, not a thing not it's not not a thing and to get to jonathan's question the city health department actually sent out a medical alert to all doctors in the city saying, don't use antibody results for personal medical decisions. So I think that answers it pretty yes. definitively or for Jonathan. Medical, exactly. behavioral, I mean, it shouldn't affect any choice that you make other than it might give you the ability to go donate your convalescent plasma and use it to save lives. But so, even after that, you know, when you go home, um, you better wash those clothes and leave your leave your shoes outside because right. even if you, let, let's say we have proven immunity, 
Yeah, or, or not, you know, yeah. let's say we know that we're not contagious, you know, we know definitively that we, our bodies are not contagious. We can still be carrying it on our shoes. Yeah. We can still yeah. be carrying it on our clothes. We cannot be too vigilant. So we have sadly run out of time. Boy, did that hour go fast. That did go really fast. Could, wow. <laughs> could, 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 could we close with you telling us how does someone uh, who wants to get involved with Survivor Corps connect with you or connect with the Corps? Absolutely. Please tell us. So first of all, we have an open Facebook group. It's open to everybody because um, COVID affects everybody. And so, and um, it is just called Survivor Core. It's an open group, please join. Our website is survivorcore.com. If you wanna get really involved, you can sign up to be an arm ambassador. Um, and you know, it's, it's a wealth of information. It is a one-stop shop for all of your questions about antibodies, about testing. The, the forum that goes on, on the in the web group, on the Facebook group is simply astonishing. The amount of support that's given to think that, you know, six weeks ago, people were amazed by the fact that I was actually telling people that I had COVID. And now we see just post after post of people posting their, do, uh, their plasma donation selfies as a badge of honor. Um, wow. with thousands of likes for each one. So please join us. We need you. We are, we are better together. We are stronger together. We are stronger united. Um, we can actually be, we can change. We have the power to collectively change the arc of history when it comes to this pandemic. Join us. Oh my goodness. What, what an inspiring way to close. Thank you, Diana Barrett, for your leadership, for spending an hour with us and taking all these questions. And thanks to all of you who joined us for this Zoom and Facebook conversation. Uh, muchísimas gracias a todos los que participaron en esta charla. There'll be more coming soon. Stay tuned. And as always, everybody, stay safe. Thanks thank so you, much. Mark. Thank you for being such Bye, an inspirational and innovative leader. We appreciate oh, you. Thank you so much. Okay. And I'll see you at that blood donation. I can't wait.